Earthlings, how you doing? Welcome to First Contact Radio. I hope you are doing well today. Let's get things started with our cosmic weather for today. Starting off with space weather at spaceweather.com. Our solar wind is moving slower than it has been. It's only at 299.5 kilometers per second. Our planetary K index back down to zero expected no more than a one within the next 24 hours and our chance for flares are very minimal as well 20 percent chance for an M class flare which are the medium types and then the X class flares as you can see are very very low only about a one percent chance the uh, reminder the lunar eclipse is coming up this weekend so if you're on the in the United States, especially particularly the western United States, you'll probably get a glimpse of what is going on. You'll be able to see the moon disappear before your eyes and then reappear again. Um, it says, after days of quiet, two new active regions are rotating over the sun's eastern limb, heralding a possible uptick in solar activity. One of them erupted during the late hours of December 7th, shown here in a movie from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. The untwisting magnetic magnetic filament hurled a fragment of itself into space but earth was not in the line of fire all right that's our space weather for today astrologically we are still in the sign of Sagittarius we're going to be for a little bit yet so remember Sagittarius it deals with the planet Jupiter it's about expansion energies are way out there in an expansive way allowing us the opportunity to push our boundaries and the borders don't forget, though, we're also in the middle of a Mercury retrograde that doesn't end until the 13th. And Mercury retrogrades are always times when communication just needs to be rethought. Think about what you're going to say. Make sure there's no miscommunications taking place when you're out and about on the road driving. Just pay a little extra attention to the road because that is a form of communication, the way in which you're communicating with the road and with, with the traveling that you are doing. So very important to deal with and remember all of those things, just practical things to be aware of. And our moon today is just moving from Taurus into Gemini. It will be in Gemini in the next couple of days. Today it's kind of in the in-between phase between the two. Gemini is the sign of the communicator, the twins. Taurus is the sign of intuition. It's pleasurable earthly things as well. And so we're moving from one to the other subconsciously. So our need to communicate and our ability to communicate are the things that are going to be focused on as we move from this phase of Taurus into Gemini. But that's coming up today. We're still we're in that in-between phase. Now the current phase of our moon, we're just about to a full moon as you can see here. It's called the waxing gibbous moon. 96% full. All right, and last but not least, we have our dream spell for today. Red spectral moon, guided by the moon. Red color of initiation, spectral tone. It's called the spectral tone of liberation. It's tone number 11, shown here by two bars. Each bar is five and the dot is one, so that's the 11. And then the ninth symbol, which is the symbol of the moon, is the kin for today. It's also the guide. The phrase for today is, I dissolve in order to purify, releasing flow. I seal the process of universal water with the spectral tone of liberation. I am guided by my own power doubled. And on the Gregorian calendar, it is Thursday, December 8th, 2011. So there you have it. That's our cosmic weather for today. Next bit of information up. Let me get this prepared because I guess I didn't get it fully ready. Our next bit of information is our Ron Paul weekly update. Here we go. Over to Dr. Paul. Hello, this is Ron Paul with your weekly update for December 5th. In response to pressure from Wall Street, the White House and central banks in Europe, the Federal Reserve last week drastically cut interest rates for currency swaps to benefit troubled European banks. This will flood world markets with more dollars and will soon mean rising prices for every American at the grocery store. 
This extra liquidity will temporarily ease the cash crunch for irresponsible bankers, but in the long run, it will make the situation much worse for consumers all over the world. Equities markets registered big gains at the news, but only for a day. Make no mistake, this is not capitalism, and this is not how a free market operates. In a free market, bankruptcies happen even to large banks. We must remember, free markets are the true and best regulators of financial mismanagement. By contrast, under our current form of special interest corporatism, certain businesses are granting too big to fail status and are never allowed to go bankrupt. They keep profits generated during the good times generated by the Fed's monetary inflation, yet their losses are socialized through inflationary bailouts. This means you and your family eventually pay for the Fed's decisions because every dollar you earn is worth less. Few people make the connection that they have enriched bankers in Europe through doubling and tripling prices of milk, eggs, gasoline, and clothing, but that is exactly what is happening. The increased pace and size of these types of desperate financial maneuvers means price inflation will hit sooner and far too fast for wages to keep up. This is how the middle class gets wiped out, as has happened so many times in the past when fiat money fails. The Fed's latest action in cooperating with foreign central banks to undertake liquidity swaps of dollars for foreign currencies is just one more reason why Congress needs enhanced power to oversee and audit the Fed. Under the current law, Congress cannot examine these types of arrangements. Those who would argue that auditing the Fed or these agreements with central banks harms the Fed's independence should reevaluate the Fed's supposed independence when the Fed bails out Europe so soon after President Obama promised U.S. assistance in resolving the Euro crisis. Rather than calming markets, these arrangements should indicate just how frightened governments around the world are about the European financial crisis. Central banks are grasping at straws, hoping that flooding the world with money created out of thin air will somehow resolve a crisis caused by uncontrolled government spending and irresponsible debt issuance. But those governments and central banks never grasp that it is their own monetary policy that allows European banks to become so wantonly over-leveraged in the first place. If those banks need liquidity, they should generate it the old-fashioned way by attracting depositors. If they cannot do so, they should be allowed to fail. Congress should not permit this type of open-ended commitment on the part of the Fed, a commitment which could easily cost American taxpayers trillions of dollars. These dollar swaps are purely inflationary and will harm Americans as much as any form of quantitative easing. Americans deserve sound money that cannot be manipulated and created out of thin air by central planners who deceitfully promise prosperity. Fiat money caused this European crisis and the financial crisis before it. More fiat money is not the cure. The global fiat currency system has proven itself a failure. We need real monetary reform. We need sound money. Thanks for calling this update. A new update is placed on this number, 888-322-1414, every Monday. The written text can be found on my website, www.house.gov. paul Under the heading, Texas Straight Talk. Thanks for calling. This is the UFO News with Joshua Poet. All right, Derek, thank you very much. This is the UFO news for today, and I have four stories for you. First story comes to us from My Fox Boston. Man captures video of glowing object in the sky. MyFoxBoston.com. Rick Olivi Olivieria. Oliveria, excuse me, walked out of a local pub last Friday night after a single drink and saw something in the sky that he calls disturbing. His cell phone captured lights in the sky moving slowly in a northward direction. Before he could get his cell phone out to shoot the video, however, Oliveria says he saw what appeared to be a very large, large object in the sky that made him feel uneasy. It was glowing red like nothing I'd ever seen glow red. It was huge. I would say it was 20 to 30 feet in depth, said 
all, all over the area. The next thing you know, he says his friend, look, uh, look, another one and one that went over us. I didn't see directly over us, but we saw it shooting off and then it seemed to stop and dance over the cooling towers. That's the video that has become so famous. All right, here we go. We've got a video of it. Let's take a look and see. Here we got the light above the sky here. This is the one he's looking at. All right, and it's flying right over the. And let's see if we move forward. All right, we don't get the disappearance part, but we do see the object itself. So there you go. We've seen this object, a round object in the sky above the Earth. All right, our next story comes to us from UFO Digest. Now, I've seen this story making its way around. It's also on the front page of Yahoo right now. Submitted by Tony Elliott. What appears to be a cloaked planet-sized alien manufactured UFO object appeared near the planet Mercury on December 1, 2011 during a coronal mass ejection. The object only became invisible when engulfed within a passing CME and otherwise is invisible. The official explanation of the object, according to Russ Howard, head scientist of the NRL group and the Nathan Rich, lead group systems engineer, is simply an artificial an artifact left over from the way raw H1 telescope data gets processed. Rather than a UFO mothership parked near Mercury, the bright spot is where the planet was on the previous day. The explanation would be acceptable if the object were cylindrical as the planet Mercury, but since it resembles a saucer shape, it would be viewed from the side of a disshaped object more than likely it isn't a ghost image of Mercury. In relation to the size of the Earth, the object would be about the size of the entire surface of the Pacific Ocean. Alien spacecraft or not, the object is not natural and has never been viewed. So let's take a look at this here. Let's see exactly what this is. All right. Sechi ahead, HI1. And uh, wow, uh, wait till you see this. Amazing. There's been some really amazing things uh, <laughs> on these sites lately. Uh, this is uh, Sechi, it's uh, the Navy site. And uh, I'm going to hit play here and show you what the hell I'm talking about. This is just insane. Oop, went a little past it there. Look at that. Right there next to Mercury. And obviously it's cloaked and does not appear until the CME hits it. Uh, pretty freaking amazing. I'm going to magnify it here in a second. But uh, you can clearly see it's not there. And then as soon as the uh, CME goes past it, it appears. I'm going to uh, put the magnifier here. And check it out. Okay. Holy smokes. Look at that. Um, that is definitely some sort of uh, manufactured object. It's uh, cylindrical on either side, uh, has uh, shape in the middle. I mean, it definitely looks like a ship to me, and, and very obviously it's cloaked. Um, All right, so there you have it. All right, there you go. Um, you see an object that's there. It's not Mercury. It doesn't have the same shape as Mercury. It's not a shadow of Mercury or what they're claiming is an artifact. There is something out there. Now, obviously, this is not a surprise to those of you who have been watching the show because you know that there's all these kind of sightings going on and a lot of things that have been seen up there by the moon, the sun, and so on and so forth. So just another bit of proof that something is going on up there for those who need that kind of proof. Now our next story comes to us here from HuffingtonPost.com. UFO hunters keep pressing White House for the answers through We the People petitions. Thousands of people who believe in UFOs and think the U.S. government knows more than admits were hoping for a breakthrough last month when they signed petitions on the We the People website. But... They got what they've been getting for decades, nothing. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy announced on the site that there was no evidence of alien life and no credible information to suggest that any evidence is being hidden from the public's eye. But ufologists 
those who study the various possibilities of unidentified flying objects aren't giving up. Two new petitions have begun collecting signatures, but unlike the original petitions in October, which required 5,000 signatures before the White House must respond, the threshold is now 25,000. Of course, there's always been a tense relationship between those who believe the truth about alien visitation is out there and the federal government. The UFO community claims the government has engaged in policies to debunk and ridicule eyewitnesses. Despite that, the Obama administration is being challenged again to reveal UFO evidence. Stephen Bassett, author of the initial alien disclosure petition in September, now has a second petition up on We the People, hoping to gather enough signatures by the December 31st cutoff date. The second disclosure petition is intended to directly challenge the response to the first disclosure petition from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Bassett, head of the Paradigm Research Group, told the Huffington Post in an email, it names names and provides direct links to the documented history of the Rockefeller Initiative, Bassett added, referring to an effort in the 1990s by billionaire Lawrence Rockefeller to get the Clinton administration to release UFO documents. But what was it about the first petition that get, into, get the White House to respond in a more UFO-friendly manner? Some critics have complained about what they perceived as a UFO conspiracy attitude in the information requests. In the previous HuffPost blog, Leslie Keene suggests that the petitions weren't worded in a way that would compel President Obama's staff to reply differently. This is not something that government officials can possibly take seriously, Keene told the New York Times bestseller. UFO general, pilots, and government officials go on the record, told HuffPost. I know that from my years of experience in meeting and interviewing them, how to approach the government on the issue. First of all, clarity is incredibly important so that they know exactly what you're talking about, Keene said. Former nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman has spent 44 years lecturing and writing on the ideas that some UFOs may be intelligently controlled extraterrestrial vehicles. He doesn't agree with the initial PRG petition that all UFO information should be released. I think there's a real national security concern here that PRG doesn't seem to want to address, Friedman said. I don't want any technological data that we have gleaned from the study of either UFO records or UFO instrument data that could be used for development of classified high-performance military systems, and I don't think that you should put that on the table. Secondly, we, re we already know that the National Security Agency and the CIA have released top-secret UFO documents. We know they exist. Friedman suggests that he'd like the government to respond to the UFO petitions. I'd be perfectly happy if they would say, look, we have a ton of classified information which you cannot which you can understand we cannot release because there are weapon implications but do indeed have personal instrument and satellite observations as well as observations of pilots chasing UFOs. The day before the new PRG petition went up on the White House site another one reared its head this one co-written by Hollywood producer Bryce Zabel and UFO historian Richard Dolan. The request simply and clearly asked the Obama administration to investigate unidentified aerial phenomena as reported by citizens, police, astronauts, pilots, and the military. Now you can see there's a bunch more to this article. It's a very important issue indeed. Stephen Bassett is going to be on the show again in the next, I'd say within the next week or so, and we will be talking about the new petition that he has available. And our very last story today comes to us from Educating Humanity. And this is, are UFOs real, famous people who believed? Now, right off the bat, so this is just a short list of people that believe in UFOs. It always amazes me that we have presidents, prime ministers, general, heads of the CIA, FBI, and a host of others that believe in UFOs, have knowledge of UFOs, and have actually seen UFOs, and still a great many people do not believe that they exist. That being said, in a recent CNN poll, about 80% of the people in the United States believe in UFOs and believe the government is covering up this information. This list could easily go for hundreds of pe pages if you were to include pilots, police officers, government dignitaries, government contractors, and celebrities, etc. Now, right off the bat, you see President Ronald Reagan. And then think for a moment now, the White House where President Ronald Reagan used to live says that there is no evidence of extraterrestrials, no evidence 
but the man who used to live in the White House is a believer. So somebody is not telling the truth. Wouldn't you agree? Some of the names on this list include Astronaut Edgar Mitchell, former NASA astronaut, has claimed that aliens exist and their visits are being covered up by the United States government. President Jimmy Carter, U.S. President from 76 to 80, promised that while on the campaign trail he would make public all documents on UFOs if elected. Senator Barry Goldwater tried to gain access to a secret building at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base rumored to house the top UFO material, but is refused. General Douglas MacArthur, the Korean and Second War, Second World War soldier, said in 1955 that the next war will be an interplanetary war. Then we've got Harry Truman, climbs on board. I can assure you that flying saucers, given that they exist, are not constructed by any power on Earth. President John F. Kennedy, the U.S. Air Force, assures me that UFOs pose no threat. Air Marshal Azim Dabpota. Zimbabwe Air Force, this is no ordinary UFO, scores of people saw it. It was no illusion, no deception. J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI from its inception, said of a famous incident while flying saucers were allegedly fi fired over at Los Angeles in 42, we must insist upon full access to disks recovered. For instance, in the LA case, the Army grabbed it and it would not let us have it for cursory examinations. And the names go on and on and on. So you could see after such names as Edgar Mitchell, President Carter, Senator Goldwater, Douglas MacArthur, Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, and J. Edgar Hoover, you can understand that these aren't really big names in Washington or the political scene. So you could understand how the White House could say that there's no evidence because those gentlemen who I just named obviously really don't really have any credibility in Washington and therefore they saw something that really wasn't anything. So it makes sense that the Obama administration would say that the White House, no, House has no information, right? Because, I mean, who's going to trust Harry Truman when he says there's UFOs? Or who's going to trust Jimmy Carter or Edgar Mitchell or Barry Goldwater or JFK, right? I mean, y you see the ridiculousness of this? All of these people who have been in Washington at the White House, some of them live there, have seen and do believe it would seem that it's ridiculous then for the White House to say there's no evidence because he's making all of these past presidents look to be liars. And these are some good men here. We know who the liar is. It's Obama. So let's trust that these men knew what they were talking about and that Obama well, he's just being dishonest at always. That's our UFO news for today. I'm going to jump away to a song. I'll be right back. What if our government was responsible for some of the greatest crimes against this nation? Would you really want to know? These are big questions, but these questions deserve answers. It's time to demand the truth.
up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Patriots arise. It's time to demand the truth. All righty, everybody, I am back. All right, today, as you heard at the beginning of the show, is December 8th, and that brings us to a little bit of history of this day. The Beatles founder was shot and killed on this day in 1980. There's a story here, and the Hollywood Reporter runs down the musical milestones from the band's first appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show to solo hits like Imagine. Thursday, March 21st anniversary of the death of John Lennon, the legendary singer-songwriter was shot and killed. December 8th, at the age of 40 in New York by Mark David Chapman at the entrance of the building where he lived. The death came just three weeks after the release of his album Double Fantasy, which marked the first album for Lennon since his birth of his son in 1975. All right, also on this day is a, a birth date of Jim Morrison. So this was quite an auspicious day. You've got the birth of one person, Jim Morrison, in 1943, I believe it was, and then you've got the death of John Lennon in 1980. So two musicians who certainly made a very big impact in this industry related to today, the 8th of December. All right. Our next bit of information we're going to get to here, I'm going to go back to Ron Paul. As I told you, on this station, Ron Paul is the candidate of choice. He's not getting the proper amount of airtime in other places, so myself and other alternative news um, agencies and news stations are making sure that we play Ron Paul so we get the information out there, share it with others, keep spreading the word because we need to get the corrupt politicians out. Ron Paul's a good man. He deserves to have the opportunity to be up there and to get the airplay. And if it takes those of us out in the Internet world to spread the word, then that's what we're going to do, right? So the video is going to be up online. I'm going to play it right now. It's up online in our playlist. It will lead you right over to YouTube, and then you can just follow the video, share it with others, so on and so forth. Anyway, let me get to the video. This is about Ron Paul and his foreign policy, in particularly dealing with Israel. I'll be back. Believe it or not, like you mentioned, that there's a better discussion in Israel on, on some of these issues than there, are, uh, than there is here in America. Uh, because uh, it's sort of dictated by one group. Maybe it's because groups like that won't invite me to their forums to debate some of these issues. Hi, my name is Jack Hunter. I'm here with Republican presidential contender Ron Paul. Good to be with you today, Ron. Thank you, Jack. Good to be with you. Well, what are the reasons we're sitting here today? A group, the Republican Jewish Coalition, has decided they're having a forum this evening with all of the presidential candidates except you. Now, why would that be? Well, I guess I can't really totally answer that since they made the decision, but it, it does raise some questions because I was disappointed that I couldn't go because, you know, I'm on uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in, in the Congress and I'm very interested in foreign policy. I've spoken out about it, you know, about the policies in the Middle East and the wars going on and, and the military industrial complex. So I have views, but they are different than the other candidates. So my, my guess is that uh, my views weren't welcome. But what about just this whole idea of having a discussion? You, you know, why shouldn't a, a view that is different not be permissible? Why shouldn't it be welcome? So I was disappointed, so uh, I welcome this opportunity to, to uh, further explain my position on foreign policy. There was a time in the 1980s when you strongly disagreed with Reagan, President Reagan, and your party. It was when Israel attacked a nuclear reactor in 1981. Almost the entire U.S. Congress voted to condemn that act, and you were one of the few Republicans who stood up and said that Israel should not have to answer to America for how she defends herself. Why shouldn't Israel be allowed to defend herself in any way she sees fit without listening to the dictates of the United States? Right. I, I remember that vote very clearly because I was uh, criticized, and the, mo the, the spirit of the moment was we have to condemn him for doing this because it was a violation of the sovereignty of Iraq and this sort of thing. So to me, it was Israel's business. So I was voting for their independence. And I think this is, <clears throat> this is a, big, uh, uh, a big difference uh, in, in the way I look at uh, Israel. I think Israel uh, should be treated as an independent nation and not a puppet of our state because right now what they have 
is they depend on us for military and they depend on us for money. And uh, if they want to have a peace treaty, they have to ask us. If they want to defend their borders, they have to get permission. But I think what some people fail to understand is Zionism is based on two basic principles, uh, independence and self-reliance. Uh, so those are, those are two very important issues. And you know, I, I think it was interesting just a few months ago when Netanyahu was speaking before the Congress, he, he said very boldly that Israel can defend themselves and Israel does not need American troops to defend that country. He did not ex expect American troops. Does that mean we shouldn't be friends with Israel? No, we should treat them as our best friend. You know, we should be trading with them and going back and forth and have facilitate friendship, which we do. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should take over their country. I think they, they sacrifice too much. And besides, just think of all the money that we have spent trying to buy friendship. The uh, best example would be Egypt. We've, we've given Egypt over the years $40 billion so they won't attack uh, Israel. And I guess some people say, well, that was a good investment. But what, how did it end up? It ended up with the people turning against Mubarak. And, and now they have a government in power that is more is Islamic radical and they're less friendly to Israel. President Obama has talked about Resolution 242 in Israel pretty much telling them they have to go back to their 67 borders. Your thoughts on President Obama's dictate? Well, being a non-interventionist, I believe that we shouldn't tell Israel what to do. They should decide where the borders are, and I think it's wrong. I certainly wouldn't dictate to Israel where their borders should be, and they should work it out with their neighbors. You supported Israel in 1981 when they attacked an Iraqi nuclear reactor. Do you support today the right of Israel to attack Iran, Iraq, or any other nation in its defense? Yeah, I think the conditions are very similar. And if they believe it's in their national security interests, uh, that should be their decisions and not ours. You point out that the three billion we give to Israel annually makes no sense when we give six billion to the Israel's enemies that surround them. Uh, the billions, as you pointed out earlier, that we spent in Egypt obviously didn't help Israel much, much less the United States. And many Israeli leaders really resent having to take dictates from the United States that's attached to this money. It is true. One time I made a statement that uh, the, their neighbors, the Arab neighbors, got twice as much as Israel got. But somebody did a fact check on me, and they said I was wrong. It was seven times as much. So, but it depends on how you measure it, I guess. So we do a lot. So if you cut out all the aid to everybody, actually uh, Israel does better than the rest. They actually have more strength because uh, we weaken the others because we send less weapons to the other, other, other countries. Let us finish with something that's of the utmost importance to Republicans right now, beating Barack Obama. Now, a lot of Republicans love Ron Paul's economic message, and they have questions about your foreign policy. When it comes to be beating Barack Obama, which we all want to do, we need to get that guy out of the White House, and poll after poll, a more, majority of Americans agree with you on foreign policy more than any of the other presidential candidates. If you'll permit me, this is from the Atlantic's Connor, Friedrich, Connor Friedersdorf's writing for the Atlantic. Quote, Remember when Paul belonged to the minority in Congress that opposed the Iraq War? Now 62% of Americans say fighting the Iraq War was a mistake. You know the Republicans who criticized Obama for presiding over the end of America's military presence in Iraq? Well, like Paul and unlike Obama, 78% of Americans support full withdrawal. And in Afghanistan, another country that Paul wants to leave, two-thirds of Americans want to see troop levels reduced. No other Republican presidential candidate does well with independent voters. This is about 20% of the electorate, the people who decide any election other than you. And you are the only Republican running for president that agrees with the American majority, apparently, on foreign policy. Does this make you the best Republican presidential <laughs> contender to beat President Obama in the general election, the fact that you were the most in sync with Americans on foreign policy? Well, it looks like that sews up the election. I better go out and look for my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be with you today, Congressman Thank you. Paul. <laughs> Good to see you. Very good. Very good interview right there. Now, if you're expecting that you're going to hear about any other candidates other than Ron Paul, sorry to disappoint you, but you're not going to happen. Not going to happen here because I think all of the other candidates are all part of the problem. They're just corrupt politicians. Ron Paul talks about the Constitution. We need the Constitution in this time that we're in because it's being violated so badly. 
we need to remember our founding fathers and what they really sacrificed for this country and we need to stand by the principles and ideals and the words they put on the page the Constitution is a very important document we can't let that be shredded and trampled upon the way the administrations are doing it because if we continue to allow that happen things are going to get really bad for the citizens of this country and that's not going to be pleasurable to anybody we can already see that there's bad things going on we, we hear the stories I, I read them all the time the only way it's going to change is if we change the way we're looking at things we've accepted bad for a long time we've accepted corruption we've gone into politics saying we're going to choose the worst of two evils how about if we stop choosing the worst of two evils and how about if we choose the best candidate how about if we choose the one who has the ideals of this country in mind that's the most important thing we've gotten away from our principles it seems and because of that all of these things are happening that are very negative and are hurting people so we need to stop the things that are hurting people which are following those that are lying and if we stop following the liars we're going to actually find the truth and that will be much more advantageous to every single American all around the world alright now the mainstream media as you know and by mainstream I will say Fox MSN and ABC and then CNN now some of these stations themselves they don't claim that they're mainstream they try to fool their listeners Fox is on this new kick that they're trying to tell people that they're not the mainstream they're the cable show they're not part of the mainstream Fox is part of the mainstream they're one of the main shows that people watch and as we all know a stream is when you're streaming a video so the main video the main stream the main news feed that people are watching out there in the world on the televisions Fox is one of them so you should you know better don't let them fool you and if you if your friends are fooled tell them to stop being fooled because they're not being honest you've heard the reports we've talked about them on the show about how news corporation is in trouble and how they've been going through their their cases in the parliament and sitting before parliament how Rupert Murdoch has been lying how his son James has been lying how there's all kind of conspiracy and controversy within their organizations well it's been going on for a long time it's nothing new to those who've been paying attention this here is a story comes to us from RT and riot wrong fakes Fox Fox fakes Moscow protest with a Athens clashes now this isn't the first time that Fox has done something like this this is just one of many times watch this listen to what they say and you're gonna realize that they're not putting the right information together on the screen and they're trying to fool the viewers who they don't think obviously are smart enough to realize the difference between Moscow and Athens let's check this out its fair share of protests and political dissent to be dealing with. Instead of keeping an eye on the ball, the country's mass media machine has turned to protests in Russia and dropped the ball on reporting the facts. Thousands of protesters have gathered in Moscow, lashing out against Prime Minister Vladimir Putin and his ruling United Russia Party. The only problem is that this video is not from Russia. Fox News Channel aired video of fires and chaos in Athens, convincing viewers that this mayhem is playing out in Moscow. The fair and balanced network paid no mind to the Greek lettering in the background. In case you're wondering, it says Greek National Bank. What matters is that this is what Moscow protests have looked like. It's not surprising whatsoever that at the moment that there would be any kind of protest, no matter how small it be in Russia, against the Russian government, that it would be greatly exaggerated in media and used by the U.S. government as well as a way to try to somehow push for a change in Russia that would be more favorable to U.S. interests. Journalist and author Eva Golinger believes mass media is Washington's most valuable weapon in encouraging revolt elsewhere under the mantle of spreading democracy, such as the so-called Orange Revolution in Ukraine or Rose Revolution in Georgia. 
perception is created that something is happening in that country that's not right and, and that the government is somehow responsible. And so therefore, if that government ends up being removed, it somehow is justified. That, that you know, the media has played a key role in creating a justification for regime change. Similar anti-government demonstrators have been reported in at least 50 other cities in Russia. U.S. leaders have leveled harsh criticism against Russia in the aftermath of Sunday's parliamentary election. And critics say its free press has worked to reinforce the narrative. The media tends to march in lockstep with the government. It tends to take its cues from the government. It tends to, you know, mobilize its resources to showcase what the government says is true, even when later it turns out not to be true. As was the case in this erroneous CNN report. Well, in eastern Russia, more than 3,000 people protested against proposed changes to the country's time zones. The video shows by CNN is not of protesters, but rather of soccer fans riding in Moscow over the killing of a fellow supporter. The problem is that we showed the wrong pictures. Only after the error was repeatedly noticed, CNN owned up to its mistake. We do apologize for the error and are grateful to the many Russian viewers who have pointed it out to us. The sloppiness of it all uh, is reflecting, you know, the, the lack of awareness of the journalists themselves. Many of them are completely uninformed about the world. They have opinions that have no factual basis to them, but it doesn't stop them because it's what looks good that matters more than what really is true. The truth is that America has its own social, economic, and political challenges to be dealing with. And while Washington works on getting its own house in order, powerful mass media outlets can work on getting their facts straight. Marina Portnaya, RT, New York. So the question is, if the video is lying, do the commentators, do they actually understand that the video they're watching is not truthful? Or are they just reading? Are they just puppets, parrots, reading the information on their screen? Because if they're more than that, if they actually know and they're lying, then they're part of the problem as well. So either they're not very bright or they're intentionally lying. Which one of the two is it? Either one, it doesn't look very good that we have potentially a not very bright person reading the news or a liar reading the news, one of the two. Now. These problems go on and on, and for some reason, it always seems to be justified on why they should do that. They shouldn't be doing that. They're lying to people. And as long as these lies continue, and as long as people continue to tolerate the lies, the lies will continue to happen. It's only when you, Fox is turned off, when you change the channel from them, and go to a credible news source, which there's tons of them available. You gotta go online, but there's tons of sources available, and you don't have to rely on Fox or CNN or MSNBC anymore because the real news will be in front of your very eyes on your own computer screen, and you'll know what the truth is. And if you do that experiment a couple times, just search for yourself, see what's going on, you'll understand where they're lying, and you'll see more and more. It's like once you see the lie, you'll see all of the lies because it becomes so evident of how they're doing it and the question is why whose side are they on apparently not the side of the people because if they were on the side of the people they wouldn't be telling the lies that are going to hurt the people that seems to be common sense I wish they would understand it apparently not now I'm going to jump over here to a clip by Dutch since I haven't had any of his reports recently but this is in regards to what's going on with the earthquake scenario out there in the world these days and as you know there's well maybe you don't know but there's been a number of earthquakes we've been dealing with and let's hear what Dutch has to say about these everybody Dutch since here it is 9 22 p.m. central time on Wednesday December 7th 2011 and there was just a 6.1 that occurred about an hour and a half ago in southern Chile Let's go ahead and pull the stats on this. It occurred at 9.7 miles deep. It's been reviewed by a seismologist, 6.1 magnitude, and the location was Atacama, Chile. Let's jump back over and take a look again. Uh, this is basically keeping up with the movement that's occurred over the last several weeks. We're expecting additional 6 and 7.0s to occur in this area. 
and I will say for the next two to three weeks, you can expect additional 6 and 7.0s to occur in this area, most likely to the east of the shore, most likely in the region of the foothills of the Andes Mountains. Um, if we look further, you could go as far north as Bolivia, as far south as the southern tip of Chile, and as far east as central Argentina. So I'd watch this oval-shaped area right here. This part of the continent is being pressed by the tremendous amount of movement that's going on on the West Pacific. And let me just give you a quick glance of that. I'm going to do an earthquake update here um, in the next day or so. But just to give you a shot of what's occurred over the last week, I mean, this is still a tremendous amount of movement to occur. You can see it's now spilling over uh, through the Philippines, going through Indonesia, Philippines, up through Indochina, and terminating at the Russian border. And then further on the European plate, you're seeing movement in Greece and in Turkey and subsequent earthquakes in Greece and Italy on the 5.0 range. So this leaves North Europe exposed, in my opinion, anywhere from England all the way to the basically east coast of Greenland and back down to Poland. So Poland to England up to Greenland. Watch this area for additional 5.0 earthquakes over the next few weeks. United States, you can see it. The movement has occurred, and we all know about it, or those of us who've been following. The North American Craton, the unsubducted plate that has remained relatively unmoved for hundreds of millions of years, is now being pushed. It's being pressed by the Pacific Plate. And this is compensation movement, in my opinion, that there's so much movement on the western side that the eastern side is indeed trying to keep up. And it's going in the opposite direction on top of that, which means that the pressure is being placed along the edge of the plate. Now, to show that to you, I'd have to show you a few different diagrams really quick. Um, here's the plate diagram of the planet, and you can see the North American plate here, South American plate, and a few others, the Nazca and Krakoa's plate. But there's another one I'd like to show you, which is the Craton map. And let's just go ahead and open that up. Okay, here's a great shot of it. Okay, this is the North American craton, and the edges of the craton are what are called the deformed craton, and then it goes down into the sea. And when you look at the earthquakes that have occurred, they're occurring along the edge of the North American craton and on the edge of the North American and South American plates where they're butting up here in the Caribbean. And so I would say, watch out. Watch the area from basically Haiti all the way west to well, Yucatan Peninsula on Mexico, anywhere in this area here over the next few weeks, we could see a large earthquake. 5.0 or greater, people will feel it, and it will, it will be reported. And that's due to the past activity. When you just look at these other earthquakes, 5.0 or greater, that have occurred. So this rough line that goes like a giant U has been pushed. And again, you can just see it. Draw the, draw the connecting dots, and that's where the craton edge is. And further south, the larger movement is along the plate edge itself. So the whole plate and the whole craton is being moved. And that says to me, watch out for additional earthquakes in earthquake-prone areas. There's several that we know of, the New Madrid, west coast down here near Baja, California, north to Pisca, which is just east of Los Angeles, and then due north into the ocean off the coast of Oregon. There's a fresh lava field that was laid there two, two or three months ago and then back east all the way to British Columbia, maybe even into Seattle. All right, cheers. All right, very good information from Dutch, always informative indeed. Now we have a couple more stories to get to. Next story here comes through some InfoWars. FBI's new definition of rape ensnares TSA agents as serial rapists. The definition of rape was expanded this week by the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Criminal Justice Advisory Policy Board. Following a barrage of emails from feminist activists who demanded change, the old definition was too narrow. Many women argued it needed to be updated. For one thing, it didn't cover rape by women against women or men against men. And we've all seen just how much that goes on these days thanks to organizations like Penn State and the Catholic Church. So in October, the FBI's UCR subcommittee advisory policy board voted to recommend the definition to be expanded. The new definition of rape, which looks to be officially adopted by the FBI in 2002, is as follows. Rape is penetration, no matter how slight, 
of the vagina or anus or any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ organ of another person without the consent of the victim. Now, FBI definition ensnares TSA agents as serial rapists. Here's the kicker in all of this. According to the definition of rape, the federal government's TSA agents are serial rapists. That's because in the course of carrying out their lewd, improper, and entirely illegal strip searches and enhanced pat-down, they are engaged in precisely the activities covered in the FBI's definition of rape namely entering the vagina and anus with their fingers without consent of the victim. This means that next time you are fingered by a TSA agent in the airport, you should seriously call the FBI and report a sex crime. In fact, it is illegal for you not to report a sex offender committing a crime of which you are directly aware. Failure to do so could make you an accomplice in that person's next sex crime, legally speaking. So there you go, folks. There's one thing that we can do to fight back. Report the TSA agents if they do something improper. Let's put a few of these perverts in jail, and maybe that will send a message to their whole organization that they need to change their tactics. Because right now, the tactics of molesting Americans is not working. So we need to change that. Now, this story here is a story that is quite unbelievable. It's a report. Air Force dumped remains of 274 troops in a landfill. All right, the incarcerated remains of at least 274 American troops were dumped in a Virginia landfill, according to the government records. The Washington, the Washington Post reported on Thursday, Air Force officials says that the dumping was hidden from families who had given authorization for the remains to be disposed of in a respectful and dignified manner, according to the newspaper. There are no plans to inform families, officials told the newspaper. New information revealed that the practice, exposed by the Washington Post in November, had become very widespread until it was halted in 2008, the newspaper reported. Last month, Pentagon and Air Force officials said they were figuring out how many remains were sent to the King George County, Virginia landfill would take combing through the records of more than 6,300 troops. The article is going to be available but there you go. These guys serve their country, and then the government says that they're going to dispose of these bodies properly, and instead they put them all in a landfill. That shows what the government really thinks about those who are putting their lives on the line for this country. It obviously isn't very much that they throw them away in such disregard at the end of their journey. And the last story here, this is part one. This comes to us from the Intel Hub. The Federal Reserve Cartel Part 1, The Eight Families. This is Part 1 of a five-part series excerpted from Chapter 19, The Eight Families, Big Oil and Their Bankers in the Persian Gulf. The Four Horsemen of Banking, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo owned the Four Horsemen of Oil, Mobile, Exxon, Royal Dutch, Shell, BP, Amco, and Chevron Texaco, in tandem with Deutsche Bank, BMP, Barclays, and other European old money behemoths. But their monopoly over the global economy does not end at the edge of the oil patch. According to the company 10K filings to the SEC, the four horsemen of banking are among the top 10 stockholders of virtually every Fortune 500 company. So who are these stockholders in the money center banks? This information is guarded much more closely by queries to bank regulatory agencies regarding stock ownership in the top 25 U.S. bank holding companies were given Freedom of Information Act status before being denied on national security grounds. This is rather ironic since many of the bank stockholders reside in Europe. One most important repository for the wealth of the global oligarchy that owns these banking holding companies a U.S. Trust Corporation founded in 1853, now owned by Bank of America. A recent U.S. Trust Corporation director and honorary trustee was Walter Rothschild. Other directors included David Davidson of J.P. Morgan Chase, Richard Tucker of ExxonMobil, Daniel Roberts of Citigroup, and Marshall Schwartz of Morgan Stanley. J.W. McAllister, an oil industry insider with the House of Saudi Connections, wrote, the Grim Reaper, that information he acquired from Saudi bankers, cited 80% ownership of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, by far the most far powerful Fed branch, by just eight families, four of which reside in the U.S. 
They are the Goldman Sachs, Rockefellers, Lehmans, and Kuhn Loeb's of New York, the Rothschilds of Paris, of London, the Warburgs of Hamburg, the Lazards of Paris, and the Israel Moses Seraphs of Rome. There's much more to this article as you can see, but it's well worth the read and I would encourage you to go ahead and check this out to understand a little bit better of what's going on. The Federal Reserve is not a good organization. It's not federal, it's private, it needs to go because it's hurting Americans and people all around the world. Let's get rid of the corruption and good things will happen. All right, very last thing we're going to do before we end the show here is our meditation for the day. So go ahead and close your eyes and relax. Close your eyes and relax. All right, today I want you to imagine that you are looking up into the sky. And as you are looking into the sky, you're able to see millions and millions of stars and as you see these millions of stars twinkling in the sky you understand that there is life on many of these planets many of these stars you understand that the universe is teeming with life and that down here on earth is just a small sampling of what the universe offers and as you look into the universe and you see these stars and you have these realizations you find that your own consciousness expands it expands in understanding that there's a bigger picture than what goes on here on earth and in understanding there's a bigger picture It fills with you with a new sense of hope. Hope in knowing that when this journey on earth comes to its conclusion, the journey continues elsewhere. And it goes on and on and on. And as we understand the vastness of the universe, in turn, we also understand that the creator of the universe is that much bigger than we even imagined. And that despite how large the entire universe is and the great creator's plan is, that we all have a place within that plan and by simply taking time out to listen, we all come to understand how we fit into the divine plan. Let's imagine that all of our chakras are activated, so energetically we are connected in with the universe as we need to be. Starting with the chakra this time at the top of your head, the crown chakra, imagine the color indigo and see this white light shining down entering the crown chakra flowing down your body from the crown chakra it goes down to the third eye and there at the third eye imagine the color violet and then the energy moves down from the third eye all the way to the throat and imagine the color blue and then see the energy continue down into the heart chakra and there imagine the color green and then the energy continues just below the rib cage to the solar plexus imagine the color yellow and then the energy continues right to the belly button imagine the color orange and then finally to the chakra at the bottom of the spine, imagine the color red and just see the energy connecting in with the earth. Now we are connected above and below. Feel all this energy flowing through you and then just allow it to overflow and form that spiritual armor all around you. And just extend that aura of protection outward around your room, 
out into the city, the state, your country, and all around the world. Everything is energy, my friends, and we have the opportunity to work with energy every given day. Decide how we are going to use it and share it with others. And by sharing it in a way that we help protect each other, we strengthen ourselves by protecting ourselves. Let's imagine now from the heart chakra sending out love all around the planet. Love, the greatest source of all, helps us to heal all problems, all worries, all concerns. Send love all around the planet. Imagine the color green and send it to each and every individual, friends and enemies, and allow the power of love to go in and transform lives of people all around the planet. And let this love go up into the cosmos and send it to the planets, the stars, the space brothers and sisters and to all the other life that exists outside of this universe. And now let's just think a good thought for everybody in the world and bring our energy and attention back to the present moment on the count of three. Three, coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two, coming back to the present moment filled with faith. And one, coming back to the present moment happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. And that's it. Another show, another prayer, another meditation. Send us on our way with some good vibes for today. Go on to the world today and be safe, my friends. Have fun with what you're doing. And keep learning. You know, the things that are taking place in the world are somewhat illusionary to what's really going on behind the scenes. We must always keep in perspective that there's a spiritual agenda and then there's the physical agenda. They don't always meet. They don't always match. And we need to learn to understand which one we need to pay more attention to. It's always the spiritual, my friends, because that is what is the guiding force of all that is going on around this planet and throughout the entire universe. For Dirk Bradshaw, my name is Josh Poe. It has been a pleasure as always. I'll be back tomorrow with more news and information. Till then, check out the videos. Check out the news stories, firstcontactradio.com, right-hand side. Get all the stories for today and for months past. That's it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'm out of here. Peace. Take care.